Hey there, and welcome to the Unleash Your Greatness Within podcast. I tell you what, it was great to have John Pico on the Unleash Your Greatness Within podcast. You already know. My passion and my mission to help you unleash your greatness within. My heart goes out to the underdogs, that, that's on their way. If you think you can, go from good to great. Okay, let's motivate. You see, it was great to have John on the Unleash Your Greatness Within podcast. You see, he's the author of the new book titled From Impressed to Obsessed. I mean, think about that. To help a customer be satisfied only takes you so far. But to take them to being impressed, okay, that's better. But why don't we take them to being obsessed about your team, your company, your product, your service. You see, John Pico has spent the last several years with his consulting company, Watermark Consulting, helping companies move into the direction and adopt these principles around creating cultures of great customer service. And you know what, in this, Unleash Your Greatness Within interview. I tell you what, he shared all kinds of nuggets that you can apply immediately. Now, if you're watching this on my YouTube channel, then I invite you to subscribe to my YouTube channel and make sure you click that notification bell so that you're the first to be notified when I come out with a new success interview or I come out with a motivational message that can help you turn your dreams and your goals into reality. Now, if you've downloaded this because you downloaded it from Google Play or iHeartRadio or my main channel, which is on Apple Podcast, listen, I invite you to subscribe to those podcasts as well. All right, without any further ado, if you are interested in great and empowering and exemplary customer service, you're going to want to listen to this interview. So without any further ado, let's jump right into it. John, welcome to the Unleash Your Greatness Within podcast. Hello, TJ. I'm happy to be here with you. It's great to have you here. Um, Listen, one of the things that we do with all of our guests is I like to get a snapshot of their background, their backstory, and so forth. So if you could just take us through a little bit of your history, hey, that'd be really useful here today. Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is John Pico. I'm the founder and principal of Watermark Consulting, which is uh, basically a customer experience advisory firm. And uh, the work I do is really about helping companies to impress their customers and inspire their employees uh, creating the kinds of raving fans that drive business growth. Uh, and in terms of how I got here, uh, you know, before I launched my own firm back in 2009, I spent a little over 15 years in the corporate world, um, holding senior executive roles that uh, I was leading at various points, sales, marketing, service, distribution, uh, even IT. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of the backstory, kind of an interesting way that I sort of got into the customer experience realm When I was in college, uh, I wanted to uh, be a DJ on the college radio station. Uh, And so I walked into the radio station and I was like, I want a show. And they said, well, good luck with that. You know, if you want anything other than the graveyard shift, you need to sell ads for us because the station actually was not supported by the university. It was a commercial station, uh, you know, on the on the university campus. So that was my entree into business. I started selling radio ads door to door. Um, And that's actually where I first began to get my taste of customer experience in terms of all the different interaction points with a customer that can shape their likelihood to do business with you or to continue doing business with you. Uh, And that eventually led me to, you know, graduate, get my MBA and then go into business. Well, that's really great. So I and I got a good show, too. Did you? You did. I I got a prime slot. It was uh, 11 to one on Sunday nights. Oh, that's which awesome. was a prime slot for college radio. Wow. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. So um, I had the similar start then as you did. I started knocking doors. And I mean, that is a, a really insightful way to start the business career is knocking doors, communicating with customers within a matter of seconds, making that first impression, and then hoping that that first impression leads to a positive impression all the way through the pipeline. So that's a question for you. So what have you seen? What You've written the book called, let me make sure I get it right, From Impressed to Obsessed. Take us through sort of the mindset 
of your book. So, you know, the, the central premise of the book, and this goes back to something that I learned, you know, when I was first selling those radio ads, uh, is that if you are aspiring to satisfy your customers, then you are aspiring to mediocrity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the reason I say that is because if, if you want to create real sustainable competitive advantage, you can't just rely on satisfying the people that you work with. You really need to impress them. You need to leave this indelible positive impression on their, in their minds that's going to make them excited to work with you again and to tell others about you. Uh, and forging those impressions is really an exercise in shaping people's perceptions and memories. Um, and that actually gets to the cognitive science, the psychology behind customer experience, which is kind of a central premise of the book. Uh, because as it turns out, the companies that do this really well are all dipping into the same set of science-based principles for shaping their interactions with with customers uh, and and really sculpting their memories as a result. Uh, Because, um, you know, that's like a key takeaway is no matter what type of business you're in, even if you're not in a business, even if you're just uh, working with colleagues internally, the likelihood of people to want to continue working with you is not going to be based on the experience that you deliver to them. It's going to be based on what they remember about that experience. You know, so if I, if somebody comes to me and says, Hey, John, you know, I remember you saying you worked with company X on so and so. I'm in the market for the same, you know, services. What did you think of company X? The next thing that's going to come out of my mouth is not based on, the experience I had with Company X, it's based on what I remember about it. And the way our brains are wired, those two things can actually be quite different. And so that's what the book is about, is how you shape these experiences that people not only enjoy in the moment, but they think fondly of uh, in the future, which helps to shape their repurchase and their referral behavior, which is obviously the lifeblood of, of any business. Oh, I think that's beautiful. And that's a huge distinction. So as I was going through your book, I wrote some uh, a little note here. And I want, I want your take on it, because I think it goes to this and creating these memories. It's not just about the experience. That's part of the puzzle. But it's really how the people interpret it a year later, right. two years later. What do they remember? How did they feel? I'm assuming as part yes. of that. Right. And so getting to that emotional piece is really important. But what I wrote down was... Great companies who make a different difference and create profits have two things in common or two things in place that I have found. Visionary leadership that values people. And then that trickles down to exemplary customer service. The companies I think of like, and I know you notate them in your book, Apple, Disney, so forth. They have a strategic way of helping you uh, remember the experience and then want to come back. Any thoughts around around any of that? Yeah, well, you know, first, when you talk about those legendary companies, I think the key thing for people to understand is that they leave nothing to chance. You know, uh, I, I think a good analogy for great customer experiences is that they are like beautifully choreographed performances. Right. And the reason I like that analogy is because like a great performance, Uh, A great customer experience, it's not that it's scripted, but it's very deliberately and intentionally designed. You know, every line of dialogue that's uttered on stage, every gesture, every movement of the actors and actresses is carefully choreographed. And the reason I like that analogy is because, you know, what do you eventually want to happen? You want your audience at the end of the performance to stand up from their seats uh, and, and to rave for an encore and then to leave the theater and tell everybody else about the performance they just saw. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think that's what the legendary companies do. And, you know, to take that analogy one step further, I argue, you know, in the book that uh, if you think about a great customer experience as a beautifully choreographed performance, there's really an onstage component and a backstage component. Um, And the first thing that you were just referring to was the backstage component, which is, you know, what is the environment that your actors, actors and actresses are operating in? What, you know, what's the environment that shapes their behaviors once they are on stage with your customers? And I think that you're right that the companies that do this well, they recognize the importance of both sides of that equation, not only focusing on what goes on on stage, which is everything your customers can see, feel, hear, and touch, 
but also what goes on backstage behind the curtain, uh, things that are invisible to your customers, but will necessarily influence the quality of the performance of the experience that's delivered to them. Where does, where does that begin? Does that begin in the onboarding process? Does that, oh, and then touch points. I think you called them actually touch points. Did you? Is that yeah. What, yeah. Touch points that impress. That's what you said in the book. Yeah. Um, that has more to do with the external customer, if I remember the book properly. Well, but, it does, but you know, yeah, yeah. but but the thing, one of the thing that, that one of the key uh, uh, principles in the book is the notion that you should use the term customer broadly. You know, yeah. sometimes the customer is an individual consumer, the one that's writing the check for your product or service, but sometimes. Right. Your customer is a colleague that's a few steps away. Sometimes your customer is an employee who you as a leader or an employer are serving and trying to deliver value to. So you ask, you know, where does that backstage shaping begin? I would agree with you. It begins even before somebody's an employee, because one of those backstage elements is how do you actually hire and select the right actors and actresses? Uh, you know, imagine in a, th in, in a theater performance, if you're just really bad at hiring, you know, good actors and actresses uh, or, or good singers, what kind of performance are they going to put on? So in the business world, if you don't do a good job of hiring and selecting people that have that customer experience gene, the ones that just bring to the table this level of empathy and interest in serving customers, that's really hard to teach people. So that's an example of one of those backstage components that comes into play even before you hire someone. Uh, but you know, you need to pay attention to that. Are there any attributes that you just named a couple really quick here? Any attributes? When I think of good customer service, one that you didn't mention, which I'm sure you would agree with, is good listening skills. Have you done any research around listening and really showing sincere interest? in the customer or in the colleague that you're working with. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, absolutely it is. And it goes back to a word that you used uh, earlier, the idea of feel. How does it feel to me? You know, that really is ultimately the, that is the arbiter of the quality of the customer experience. It's how the customer feels after their interactions with you. Uh, and so, you know, the idea of listening to them, actively listening so that they feel heard, you know, it's, it, there's a big difference between listening and being robotic in your responses sure. uh, versus listening and really engaging with a customer and empathizing with them. And, uh, you know, another uh, quality that I would toss out to you that I think is very important is uh, people just taking exceptional ownership and accountability for any customer need request or inquiry that comes across their desk. Uh, you know, this is the sad state of the world is that uh, the bar is set very low. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what I mean by that is. TJ, when you like call your credit card company or your cable company or your health insurer and you ask them a question and they don't have the answer, they need to do some research and the representative says, okay, I'll call you back with the answer. Do you really think they're going to call you back? I mean, <laughs> it just never happens. And so the idea of demonstrating accountability and ownership, if you just step forward and say to a customer, I... I'm going to take care of this for you. I can help you with this. If you just say that with conviction, you change the tenor of the whole interaction because suddenly, you know, you're inspiring confidence. I see that somebody's got my back. Somebody's taking ownership for my request. And then provided you actually do what you say you're going to do. Even if that person doesn't in the moment, that employee in the moment have the answer to say, hey, I'll figure it out. I'll find out. I'm here right. for you. Right. And that's, you know, it's actually one of the principles in the book is about being an advocate for customers. One way to be an advocate is to say, you know what? I don't have the answer, but I know where I can get it. I know where I can go. And I'm going to do that on your behalf instead of just telling you, oh, you got to go call this other department. Here's the number. Um, you know, that feels like a very different experience than somebody taking ownership and saying, I can help you. I know where to get the answer to your question. And I'm going to do that. And I'm going to call you back with it by 5 p.m. tomorrow. It seems like table stakes, but it's so rare that companies um, uh, get their representatives to provide those kinds of interactions that when you do it, it sets you apart from the crowd. I have two stories coming to mind and I want your feedback on. 
One is I was flying to um, a keynote in Cincinnati. I'm in the Northwest. I flew to Cincinnati. And on the way, as I sat in the plane, I was flying on an airline that I typically don't fly on. As I was sitting there, the door was about to close. And I noticed the three seats in front of me were totally empty. And here I was in the coach section and I was kind of squished a little bit. And I noticed these three open seats. As the flight attendant walked by, I said, hey, sir, I'm curious, can I, once we get started, once the door closes, can I jump in the three, one of the three seats in front of me just to give a little bit of space? He looked at it. He says, absolutely. Once the door is closed, if no one is sitting there, you have my permission to get in the seats in front of you. I sat back and I thought, wow, instead of immediately saying, no, you have to stay in your seat. The idea was absolutely, assuming the door closes and no one is there, you can go in. Well, lo and behold, that door was about to close and three people walked onto the plane and sat right in those seats. And I couldn't help but sit there and think that was skill. That was class right there. Intuitively, he must have known that this was a full flight, first of all. Uh, this flight attendant must have known that he could have said, no, it's a full flight, but he didn't do that. He said, sure, when the door closes, if no one's there, you can sit there. He let circumstances dictate the decision instead of himself dictate the decision. And I went back afterwards to back to the, the back of the plane. And I said, I don't know how, how long you've been doing this type of work and so forth, but I just have to say, I noticed what you did up there and I'm going to do this speaking engagement and I'm going to tell this story. And he said, you know, I've been working for 21 years for this airline and I just learned it's better not to tell the customer no, instead of finding an element of the environment to dictate uh, the decision, if you will. And I thought, wow, that's a skill somewhere along the line. He intuitively understood that, or he received some training to develop that. And that's why I think that we have to provide that training and some of those out-of-the-box ways of thinking. Any thoughts that are going through your mind on that? Yeah, I think it's a great example. And I, I think it, it also gets back to the point of training is valuable and training can move the needle. But they're also, you know, I, I think that that individual brought to the table when he was hired by the airline he brought to the table some qualities that made it easier for them to really bring that kind of interactional approach, uh, you know, with customers out, uh, you know, if he wasn't just sort of doing it by default. And I think it kind of underscores the importance of making sure that, um, you know, you, you're hiring people that kind of bring that skill to the table. Actually, it's an airline story. So I'll give you another airline story with um, yes, do. Southwest. Southwest has long prided itself on saying, you know, we hire for attitude and we train for skill. Uh, and, you know, what that means is they're not going to put an unqualified pilot in the cockpit, right? <laughs> but they might not hire a qualified uh, pilot if he or she doesn't really demonstrate the behaviors and the values that Southwest is really trying to infuse its customer experience with. So, for example, you know, you've probably flown Southwest, your listeners have, you know, that they're th thematically, they're about sort of bringing more fun to flying. You know, they, they're flight attendants that wrap the safety demonstration, make it on YouTube all the time. Well, you know, if you have a pilot that doesn't have that kind of demeanor, uh, they, they might not fit in culturally um, and they might not fit in with the kind of experience that Southwest is trying to create for customers. So, um, yeah, I mean, everything that you described, I think, just reinforces this idea that none of this happens by accident. It is very deliberate and it's very intentional. It's about getting the right people on the bus and, you know, uh, orchestrating those interactions with customers in a way that's going to leave them with those positive, favorable impressions. Well, and Southwest Airlines had the value of fun-filled spirit, servant-orient, whatever their phrase was. I remember when I interviewed Ken Blanchard, the author of The One Minute Manager on the podcast a couple of years ago, he said, even the pilots between flights, you would see them get out of the cockpit and help some of the other people in the plane pick up the trash and clean up and organize and so forth. Right. That's a cultural thing. And I'm, I'm thinking, um, 
who knows exactly what it was like in the first, let's say, first year of Southwest Airlines. I'm sure they were really trying to establish this type of culture. But I think over time, this became the acceptable culture, which attracted a certain type of people. And I think in the beginning, probably very vigilant. Throughout time, they were vigilant. And I think it attracted thousands of great people that inherently, like you said, bring in certain skills and attributes and experiences. I, yeah, I think they've done a good job. Yeah. I mean, there's a flywheel effect uh, in play yeah. here, right? You know, when, once you start having this culture um, and, and this experience that you're delivering in the marketplace that resonates with people who are customer focused, it draw, just draws more of them into your organization and it just you know makes that flywheel spin faster and faster, and it becomes hard to to, to really compete against you. Uh, another story about Southwest, because you know you you talk about the pilot coming out and helping with other people's jobs. Well, you know where does an environment like that start? It starts at the top, and one of the uh, stories that I love about Southwest is with their co-founder Herb Kelleher, um, you know, who was a very colorful character, very customer focused, also very employee focused. Yep. And the story that I always remember with Herb Kelleher is that uh, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving every year, he would leave his uh, office at Dallas Love Field, which is where Southwest was, was headquartered, and he would actually go out on the tarmac and he would help the baggage handlers to load and unload the bags. And he did that because it was the busiest travel day of the year. So it's like all hands on deck. Uh, and the key to Southwest success is turning those planes around quickly. That's how they keep prices low because they turn the planes quickly and basically keep them up in the air for a lot longer than competing airlines. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, he's basically chipping in. I mean, think about the stories that circulate with the workforce at Southwest when the baggage handlers see the CEO and founder of the company coming out and helping load and unload bags. I mean, you just, there's just the, the cultural impact of that cannot be overstated. I, I remember, and you might be familiar with the story, Sam Walton of Walmart once a month or once a week, I don't remember what it is. So I'll get it a little bit off here, but he would fly into cities that had a Walmart and he would look at the end stands and then correct, fix those end stands. And he, whatever that, that taught, uh, a principle, I think, in many ways, of even the CEO can get down and work and make things better, but it also taught the people on the floor the things that were important, right? He right. showed it through example what's important. Exactly. Profits and, and culture and so yeah. forth. Yeah. And, you know, it is uncanny how you, you, you look at legendary leaders. It's uncanny how many of them uh, oh, right. embrace that approach, you know? So, uh, you you talk about Sam Walton. I think about uh, Walt Disney and how when he would ever walk around the park, if he saw a piece of litter on the ground, he would pick it up and and put it in the trash. And it's just like you said, it's this demonstration of what matters and that no job is below anybody in the organization. You know, we are all unified, coalescing around one goal to deliver a great experience to our customers and no matter what it takes to do that, you know, I'm going to roll up my sleeves sleeves, and I'm going to make that happen. Okay. So that brings up a key point. And you brought it up a few minutes ago, ownership, accountability mixed with a uh, feeling. Okay. So let's take accountability and, and feeling together. What is ringing through my mind right now is a culture has to lead, and this comes from leadership is share as much information as you can with your employees, empower them, arm them with as much information as possible. That way in the moment, they feel empowered to make a decision on the behalf of a customer because we all know that it costs more money to get a new customer who's never uh, been served by your company versus keeping and maintaining existing customers. I mean, if we're just talking bottom line, right? So the key is arming people with as much information. And what I find, I don't know if you've seen this through your consulting and so forth, is sometimes leaders withhold information out of a desire to main sun, maintain some sense of control or uh, there's a scarcity mindset in place. What do you say about companies that thrive, uh, that in, but that also inspire ownership and how that relates to information? 
Yeah. So uh, the dynamic that you're talking about in terms of hoarding information, I mean, I do think that exists in organizations at any level because people have a misguided sense that information is power. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if I share it with anyone else, I lose some of my power. I think that the onus is on leaders within the organization. And, you know, again, this just gets back to the importance of good leadership uh, to really reward those who actively share uh, information with others, help others to succeed, because culturally people need to see heroes being made out of the folks who are not hoarding information, but who are actively sharing it in an attempt to make others successful so that the broader organization is successful. Um, and I, I think it, 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 again, just comes back to helping employees see what right looks like. And oh, if the CEO that. hoards information, uh, then you know that's that's a poor model that that others are going to follow, um, and and that's not where you want to end up. I think also it's worth you know a, a helpful uh, parallel to draw here that that I talk about in the book is look at this through sort of the lens of what you would want your customers to feel like, how you'd want to treat them. You know, would you? I think there are some companies, some executives that would say, well, no, I'm not going to hide information from my customers. We want to be transparent. Well, okay, if that's the model that you're going to adhere to with customers, why not adhere to that same model with employees? Because they're a type of customer as well. And, you know, what I talk about in the book is this notion that the very things that help to cultivate engagement between a customer and a company are not all that different than the things that cultivate engagement between an employee and a leader or an employee and an employer. And so, you know, if you look at the things that make for a great consumer experience, the accountability, the ownership, the transparency, the advocating for you, just take all of that, lift it up and put it right with your employee experience, with how you interact with your employees, because you'll be well served just applying those same techniques to that audience. Totally agree. You make me think of how we treat employees and so forth. T.J. Watson with IBM, um, the legend is told that he would go down and visit with different teams and groups and so forth, and he would have his checkbook in his back pocket. And every once in a while, he would write on a check, $15, thank you for this effort over here, or he'd be told from a manager over here that someone did something great, and he would write a little check. And when I was reading about those reports, they said that many of those checks that TJ Watson, the founder of IBM, that many of those checks were never cashed because what was more <laughs> meaningful to the employee was the attaboy, the atta girl, the tap yeah. on the shoulder, right? The recognition for a job well done. And I just think companies don't provide that enough. They just yeah. expect you to do a and job, right? And you know, this again goes back to the parallels with the customer experience. You want customers to feel good right? After interacting with you. That's well, right. you want employees to feel good on the job as well. And in part, that's about expressing gratitude to them, making sure that there's a balance of feedback, that there's genuine coaching, but that you're also taking the time to give them the pat on the back, uh, you know, when they deserve it. And I remember, you know, before I launched my, my consultancy, uh, you know, I was um, leading a uh, service for um, a Fortune 100 financial service uh, services company. And uh, I would make sure that um, this is back in the days when uh, customer surveys were still being done on paper. Okay, uh, I'm going to date myself here. But anyway, whenever we got a, a survey back, if it was praising an individual within the company, I would actually make a copy of it. I'd write a note on it and send it to them. Or sometimes, just because it was kind of neat to surprise them, I'd actually just pick up the phone and call them out of the blue. Dude. And, you know, this, this is an example of a small gesture, but it makes such a huge impact. And there are many other leaders, you know, who have, uh, who have leveraged the art of the handwritten note, you know, so beautifully to provide a demonstration to employees that, hey, you know what, I'm not, I'm not ignorant to the value that you bring to this organization, to the efforts that you bring. And I really appreciate it when you, when you do it well and when you go the extra mile for our customers. And I think that that is an example of one of those simple, low-cost gestures that really has the power to transform uh, a culture and an organization. 100%. Um, I, a few years ago, my wife, uh, we discovered that our washing machine wasn't working. 
And so we called the warranty company. They came out, had a great attitude. We'll come back out and we'll get it fixed. A couple of days later, another person comes out, great attitude. And I just thought the customer service in the beginning was immaculate, right? It was just great. By the third person, a week, two weeks later, who said they didn't have a part that would take four weeks to get in, my wife went from thinking, wow, I'm feeling like I'm treated well. Uh, this is a positive experience to flipping, right? Flipping to this place of, I just want to get it fixed. And we went about four weeks uh, without a washer before they could found out that they couldn't reorder. They couldn't find the little spring that it was missing to run the machine properly. And they ended up replacing the whole machine. But I remember coming out of that experience thinking <clears throat> the hospitality, the positive countenance um, will only take you so far. That will only take you, I think, like you said in the beginning, it'll only take you to a place of maybe satisfaction. But there's another part of the puzzle, which is you've literally got to go to bat to help that person resolve their concerns. Any thought about that? Yeah, I think, you know, what uh, What I think you're touching on is the idea of the importance of nailing the basics, the fundamentals consistently well, um, because I, I think a lot of companies and a lot of business leaders, they kind of get they get drunk on new technology, like you know, they, they their attention gets focused on uh, you know the the shiny a new shiny object on the street, whether that is you know big data, predictive analytics, AI, whatever. And I'm not all those things are valuable, but if you're not delivering on must have elements of the experience with the customer. In the case of you know, the dishwasher, just having a handle on your inventory and the ability to procure whatever parts that you need. If you don't have a handle on those fundamentals, you are going to be limited in your ability to overcome uh, any kind of dissatisfaction or unfavorable impression. And um, you know, the actually one example I like to use in this regard is with Nordstrom, uh, which um, you know is out headquartered out in your part of the woods, right in uh, in the Northwest. And Nordstrom has developed a great reputation for customer experience in an industry that you know is not really well known for it. And one of the things that I talk about in in my speeches with Nordstrom is. Uh, a small detail that they incorporate into their customer interactions that really stands out in the mind of a consumer. And that is, if I go to the men's store at Nordstrom and I buy a dress shirt, uh, after I ra they ring it up at the register, the salesperson will never put the merchandise in a bag and hand it to me over the counter. They always walk around the counter look me in the eye, shake my hand, hand me the, the bag and, and, and thank me for doing business at Nordstrom. Now, if you've never shopped at Nordstrom, that's one of those things. It's one of those details in the experience where you feel like you know, you're on a different planet, you know, because you never see anything like that at another department store. But what I always tell people is imagine if I go into Nordstrom and it takes me 30 minutes to find someone in the men's store to help me buy the shirt. Mm -hmm. You know, by the by the time I find someone after I ring up the purchase, they could do like a double flip over the sales counter to give me my my, my package. But it almost doesn't matter because I have fallen off of the cliff of dissatisfaction. You know, they have been so wanting and just delivering on the basics that any nice to haves are not going to make a difference. So I think that's you know that's what I take away from your dishwasher story is that you got to make sure you don't get too clever too early with the customer experience. You want to make sure that you really are nailing the must-haves that your customers are looking for uh, consistently well. But some people aren't seeing it. So I work uh, in some of my, the sectors I work in is the transportation trucking industry, which might have a paradigm or uh, a belief that that industry maybe is a certain way, salt of the earth, whatever. I remember one of the regional managers told me that 35 years ago, when he started with another company, the owner of that company, which today is a well-known trucking company, um, told him, you don't need to worry about customer service or being nice. Your job is to deliver goods from one point to the next point. And so here we are 35 years later, right? And he's in my training, for example, and we talk about, no, 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 no. And it just was a, 
a light bulb moment for him to realize, no, customer service happens at every level of the organization. Every department plays a role. Every department, every person has an impact on the external customer. And usually, tell me if you agree with this, it seems like oftentimes the way we treat people are and are expected to treat people internally often is mirrored to the external customer. Would you say that's true in your research? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, you know that's why I think that the, uh, the behaviors that leaders and individuals in the organization are demonstrating to one another are so critical because they, they provide that model that people are going to follow in interactions, not just with internal folks, but also external customers. Um, it's almost like, the behaviors that are demonstrated internally give people a license to demonstrate those behaviors externally. And I think a great example of this I'd give you would be um, responsiveness is one example. Uh, you know, if I'm your boss and you text me or you email me or you leave me a voicemail and it takes me days to get back to you, yeah. implicitly, I am saying, okay, that is, that's acceptable somehow. And, and then, you know, you might come to the conclusion, okay, well, if, if that's what my boss means about being responsive, you know, that if I get back to somebody within a few days, that's, you know, okay, then I guess that's what I can do with my customers and, you know, done and done. But obviously it's not. And, and so if you, if you have in your mind a level of responsiveness that you want your employees to demonstrate with customers, well, then you better darn make sure that you're demonstrating that level of responsiveness uh, with the employees. Um, another example I like to use is the idea of giving people your undivided attention, because it's so rare in today's world with so many devices around us glued to our phones you know, it's hard to get people to even look up and make eye contact. And so one of the things I think is very valuable in the customer experience is to make, you want to make customers feel special, give them your undivided attention. All right, fine. Well, so if you're an employee and I'm your boss and you like kind of walk into my office and say, you want to talk to something, let's talk to me about something. And I'm like, oh yeah, go ahead. I'm listening. I'm just, you know, I got to bang out this email over here. I mean, what message does that send about what it looks like to provide somebody, you know, your undivided attention? So I think absolutely leaders in an organization need to be highly sensitive to all of the subtle cues and signals that they send to people about what right looks like, what behaviors you should be modeling when you engage with customers. And then when something goes wrong, by the way, you're the author of From Impressed <laughs> to obsessed. And that, yes. that's a high standard. And I know that it's achievable because there's companies out there that have done it, right? Absolutely. So, so it's absolutely achievable. I came across some time ago, how to respond to service failures by Lee Cockerell, former executive vice president of operations at Walt Disney World Resort. Here are three points. I'm just sharing it with the audience, and, and I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with these. Apologize and ask for forgiveness. When, when something is not done properly, apologize and ask for forgiveness, he says. Number two, review the complaint with sincerity. That's that human touch, uh, John, that you're talking about, right? Pick your eyes up. Listen. Be there in the moment. Bloom where you stand. And then number three, he says, fix the problem and then follow up. And I think these are just fundamental principles that, hey, we could all do a little bit better, right? Let's let, and, and I would think about leadership. So here's my, let, let's do this as the last question for you. How would an organization begin the process of creating that culture, that customer service culture, any, any particular steps you would have leaders look at first? Yeah, well, I think that, uh, you know, you and I were both in the uh, keynote and education business, and we deliver these kinds of programs to people. And I think that those programs are valuable, uh, in, particularly for an executive team that, you know, in this case, they might not even have a common definition around what is customer experience? Uh, you know, what does that actually mean? I mean, actually, a common misconception is that the term customer experience and customer service uh, are synonymous. 
Uh, and I actually argue that, you know, nothing could be further from the truth. So, you know, I'm not going to suggest that a training program, any ex- even the best executive education program is somehow going to be the silver bullet. You flip a switch and suddenly, you know, everything's perfect and everybody's aligned. But the value in a program like that is it helps to get everybody on the same page around what is it that we're even trying to achieve? You know, what does right look like? What is our vision for what a gr- what constitutes a great customer experience? Because that's really a critical first step um, in order for any executive team to really coalesce around the customer experience imperative. Because a common thing that I see is, you know, for example, you've got the head of sales who the, the moment that he or she hears the term customer experience they might tune out because they think, oh, customer experience, that's what the service people do in the 800 line call center. And and, and so then they tune out and they're not listening anymore and it's meaningless to them. And similarly, the head of R&D or of engineering might say, oh, customer experience. No, we don't have that, we're we're engineers. So I think that that's an important step is to make sure that everybody is on the same page and using the same vernacular uh, around just what this customer experience thing is and then secondly, most importantly, the role that they personally play in influencing it. We talked about the model that leaders create for others to follow. And I really do believe that many leaders don't appreciate the personal influence that they have by virtue of the personal interactions that they engage in with their workforce. I like to tell leaders that when you go to work every day, it's like you're on stage, because every employee is, uh, is scrutinizing your every move, every hallway utterance, every grimace, every eyeball roll, uh, you know, they're, they're scrutinizing it for a sign of what right looks like, of what you value, of what the organization values. And so I think that it's important for executives to open their eyes to the, the perch that they inhabit and therefore the influence that they have on the organization as a whole. Well said. I think it's spot on. Uh, my experience in 20 years is that if you bring a training, I'm going to double down on this. If you bring a training program in, and let's say you bring it to the frontline employees, they will appreciate it. But there's just a little bit of cynicism, right? It's cynical. Um, if the leadership doesn't harmonize with it, that they don't strive, I'm not saying they have to be perfect, but make attempts to fall in line with some of those uh, higher level principles, I would call them. I remember right. Ken, Blanchard on, Ken, Ken Blanchard on that uh, podcast we did a couple of years ago. He, he said, remember this, TJ? He says, leadership is mirrored throughout the organization. And I think what just doubling down on exactly what you say, leaders have to get behind this movement for it to sustain itself throughout the organization. And the sooner leadership can get behind these customer service principles, which are really common sense, great principles. But as Stephen Covey says, common sense is not common. So Mm -hmm. people have to be reminded. And the best way to do that is when the executive team can exemplify it in their day-to-day interactions, rewarding people when there's a need to reward. I would even go one step further on that. Don't just reward the end result, reward the effort. Sometimes we overlook the effort along the way. So just as a last thought uh, from my side is just leadership plays a huge role in this as you have just articulated. Agreed. Any any last uh, thoughts that you would like to share? I I think uh, I I would just encourage your listeners uh, to really appreciate the notion that no matter what role they possess, no matter what title they hold, they have a customer. Uh, And they should just commit to not just satisfy that customer, but to impress them, to deliver an experience to whatever constituency you serve that just is so exceptional, so polished, so professional, so pertinent that people just rave about you and can't wait to continue working with you in the future. Love it. Love it. Okay. Where can people get your book? So excited. Sure. So uh, the best way to learn more about the book and and to buy it is at the official website, which is www.impressedtoobsessed.com. And that's the number two, impressed, the number two, obsessed.com. And it's, of course, available at uh, all your favorite retailers, uh, but you can get to those retailers through the official website. Awesome. Hey, 
John, thank you for being on the Unleash Your Greatness Within podcast. Thanks. I enjoyed it. You bet. 